All right. So welcome everybody to the first of our three <coughs> this panel discussions on envisioning statehood. Um, we're gonna be looking at taking back our justice system this evening. I'm Ann Anderson, chair of the DC League's Committee for Full Rights for DC Citizens. So let me just be clear, the League of Women Voters is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to empowering voters and defending democracy. We are well aware that we're in the midst of an election campaign season. So we wanna be clear that the League doesn't advocate for or against any candidate or any party. As a group that works on full representation for everyone living in DC, we acknowledge that we're on the traditional land of the Nacochtank, that are also known as the Anacostan and Piscataway peoples. And we wanna pay respect to their elders, both past and present. We also acknowledge that after DC was founded, enslaved people worked the land and built much of the early infrastructure and buildings. And we pay respect to them and to their descendants. So our purpose tonight is to explore some aspects of how our justice system will be affected when we become a state. So why are we looking at this now? Because in the 221 years since DC was founded, we have never before been this close to achieving statehood. So we've been getting more questions about what would change. We went to experts, therefore, who've been working on this to bring us up to date on these issues. We expect a good substantive discussion and ask us all to please assume good intentions from all participants. Let's listen to each other, learn from each other, and feel free to enter your questions in the chat so they can be picked up during the Q&A period after our panelists have spoken and had a short discussion period with the moderator. You've already noticed we're recording for future viewing and as I've mentioned, live transcription is, in, is available. So now I now have the distinct honor of introducing our moderator, Denise Rolark Barnes, who will then introduce our panelists. Denise is the publisher and second generation owner of the Washington Informer, succeeding her father, the late Dr. Calvin W. Rolark, who founded the newspaper in 1964. That is the day I arrived in DC. The Washington Informer is the multimedia organization serving the Amer African American community in the Washington metropolitan area. Denise is also president of Washington Informer Charities, a nonprofit organization that promotes 21st century literacy and sponsors writing competitions, internships, scholarships, and other events promoting African American history, culture, and literature. She's past chair of the National Newspaper Publishers Association, the Black Press of America. Denise serves on the boards of several local nonprofit community and municipal organizations, and she's an inductee in the DC Hall of Fame. So Denise, I turn it over to you. And thank you so very much. And uh, this is really um, a great service the League of Women Voters are providing to the residents of the District of Columbia. And I'm honored to actually host this event or to be your moderator <laughs> this evening and to uh, hopefully engage us in a very lively discussion about um, you know, what statehood is gonna look like for the District of Columbia, particularly as it relates to um, our, our criminal justice system. And we've got some wonderful uh, experts here to, to really give us a deep dive into this conversation. So I look forward to that. To that. Uh, I also encourage everyone to put their questions in the chat. We have some that uh, we'll kick off with, but you know, this is a conversation for residents of the District of Columbia. So we wanna hear from you. Um, to, as we move along through the program. 
So at this point, it's my pleasure to introduce our panelists. And I'm going to start with uh, someone I told who I was told who is really <laughs> the star tonight. I'm not sure why Keith, but I'll find out in a minute. Uh, but Keith Forney, who is a member of the DC League of Women Voters Committee on Restore the Vote, um, where they have been working with a wide range of organizations uh, to make it easier for DC citizens currently incarcerated to register to vote get their mail-in ballots, and also get information about the candidates on their ballot. His lived experience with the Federal Bureau of Prisons has been very helpful to the committee's work. When Keith is not volunteering for the league as president of Fournay Enterprises, he is responsible for all operational and management aspects of the company. Keith has more than 25 years experience in construction management general contracting, and 30 years of contracting logistics management expertise. Uh, using his experience, he's in the process of rebuilding his company by way of new business opportunities that his company may pursue. And this is a good time to be doing that, Keith, because there's a lot of resources out here for businesses like yours. So I wish you the best of luck uh, as you pursue your new endeavors. Our second panelist is Sherry Shelley Broderick the Joseph L. Rao Jr. Chair of Social Justice at the David A. Clark School of Law at the University of the District of Columbia. We won't say that she's supposed to be on vacation because she's here, so she's not on vacation, but you know how we do these days, so I just thought I'd throw that in there. She served as interim and then Dean of the school for 20 years from August 1998 until June 2018, having previously served as clinical director associate dean and faculty member since 1979. Professor Broderick chairs the DC Task Force on Jails and Justice, charged with redefining and reinventing the District of Columbia criminal justice system and ensuring that jail is one part of a just and equitable system. She serves on the boards of DC Appleseed and DC Vote. She served four terms on the District of Columbia's Access to Justice Commission. She also hosted more than 300 editions of Sound Advice, a UDC cable television show available in 200,000 DC households, providing information about legal issues affecting the district's most vulnerable residents, including predatory lending, domestic violence, AIDS, and the district's abuse and neglect system. And of course, not least, but last, Casey M. Anderson, uh, the Policy and Communications Manager for the Council for Court Excellence. Um, she develops, manages, and implements CCE strategic, strategic communications and supports the development and implementation of CCE's diverse criminal legal system policy and education initi initiatives. She also serves as a staff leader for the Criminal Justice Committee. Before joining CCE, Ms. Anderson worked as a program associate for the Sentencing Project, interned with Cure National, and supported the Rethink Justice DC Coalition with their successful campaign to end the privatization of one of the DC, one of, uh, DC jails. So I am honored to bring these panelists to you. Um, we're gonna start off uh, our conversation with, with each one and we'll start with Keith who will give us, uh, and I, hopefully we can stick to the time, a, a five minute uh, conversation or a five minute introduction uh, to your remarks and then we'll go to the question. So Keith, I'm gonna start with you. Uh, thank you, Denise. Thank you, Ann, for that wonderful introduction. <clears throat> but I think in listening to the introduction, all know who are the real experts in this three-person panel. And I am not one of those experts, but I will lend whatever uh, two cents I have to the conversation. I'm with the League of Women Voters DC's Restore the Vote Committee. And we're here talking about <clears throat> how being a state DC statehood would impact uh, the judicial system. <clears throat> and so I'm gonna have two really separate comments. One, a global comment about the judicial system in general, and then how uh, the things that we are doing as a committee 
um, to uh, to impact those DC residents who are away for a, a time being. <clears throat> so for most, I think crime and punishment is a distant land that most people believe they will never encounter. So most people don't give a whole lot of thought about how the wheels of justice grind, who it grinds, and why. I submit that all crime is not equal, and all people charged with a crime are not equivalent. We know human nature, though, um, is such that people making decisions predominantly, but not exclusively, are based on what's good for their personal career. When prosecutors have no stake in the community, they have a tendency to be less caring about the impact on that community as a whole. And they are prone to ask judges for as much time as possible. Why? Because it looks good on their resume. Irrespective of the nature and circumstances of the crime. Again, why? Because they are not accountable to the community they have jurisdiction over. I think it is without question that those who have the least tend to get the most time. I think I've lost you all for just a second. Uh, clicked on the wrong thing. Yeah, shoot. Well, I'm going to keep talking even though I'm on the wrong page. You're still, you're still here though. Okay. Um, so we understand that, again, those who have the least well, tend to get the most time. And what does that do? That has a snowball effect of tearing families who are already struggling for a whole host of reasons. Statehood allows us to put people in positions who are at least somewhat accountable to the community. And uh, let me give you, I'm going to read just a little uh, excerpt from a uh, a blurb that I, I found regarding Baltimore State Attorney Marilyn Mosby. In 2020, her office announced that they were dismissing all pending charges for drug possession, prostitution, trespassing, open container, public urination, paraphernalia possession, attempted distribution of drugs, and minor traffic offenses. And they would stop prosecuting those offenses. Her office then dismissed about 1,400 pending cases dismissed them another 1,400 warrants, and that became a permanent change. Well, what's the, what was the effect of that? At least between March of 2020 and March of 2021, violent crime in Baltimore dropped by 20%. Property crime dropped by 36%, and there were 30, 13 fewer homicides over the previous year. She said that police are going to follow what they've been doing for the past year which is not arresting people based on their offenses and the ones that referenced above. Clearly, she suggests that the data shows that there's no public safety value in prosecuting low-level crimes. Now, you can agree with her position or disagree with her position. And there are, frankly, no guarantees that over the long term, the steps she's taken will work what will, uh, or will continue to work. But what is important was her willingness to fight crime with an eye on what was important to her community that she serves and she's accountable to. So having accountable people to accountable to the citizens of the District of Columbia is a very important aspect of not only the criminal justice system, which we're here to talk about tonight, but frankly, all different agencies. For our part, the League at the Women Voters Restoration Committee, we're striving to ensure, at least for the time being, to those who are those folks who are in the system for a wide variety of reasons are incarcerated, are still given the uh, opportunity to vote by way of uh, registering to vote, uh, by way of getting candidate information, issue information, and actually have a, the, receive their ballot. Uh, what we've done, one of the things we did just this year, we opened a, a uh, toll-free collect call phone number for DC uh, residents who are incarcerated, be they in DC jail, or more importantly, the Bureau of Prisons, uh, which they could be almost in any state. Now they have a way to call us, and we are manning this volunteer line with volunteers five days a week. They have opportunity to call us to say, one, are they registered to vote? Uh, two, um, alert us that they haven't either gotten their voter registration information or haven't gotten their ballot. And three, to ask us again about candidates, information and or issues information. And we use the Vote 411, the League of Women Voters Information um, platform to provide um, citizens uh, that information or residents, DC residents, that information. 
We also make sure that, you know, if, if there are any cracks in the system, they didn't get their ballot, they didn't get their registration, you know, we've taken steps to even mail them voter registration information so that way they can register the vote. We think that this is important. Why? Because in order to get citizens or residents back into the ability of, of back into the habit of being a citizen, you have to start small. And these are some of the small steps. Voting is an important aspect of being a citizen of, of this United States. And then not only does it have the effect of one, re-engaging them into the process of being a citizen, civic minded citizen, it also then uh, trickles down to the other family members who may not have been as inclined to participate, but they see that the person who has just come back from incarceration or even incarcerated is still taking the time to vote. That has some impact on those who are watching because they watch what their elders do. So for better or for worse, at least it gets the entire community in the habit of voting which is we know is a critical aspect of being a citizen. We also help monitor DOC and, D and BOP, Bureau of Prisons, because they're the, both the president and the DC law have made a lot of uh, new laws, which are obviously not universal. There's only two or three states that have uh, prisoners who can, or felons who can vote, but <clears throat> they are slow in implementing these policies. They're slow in ensuring that they get ballots and voter registration information to our residents in, in their facilities. By bird dogging them, we're helping to make sure that they are actually actively and positively implementing the new rules, um, ensuring that our residents uh, get to participate fully in the, in the voting process at a bare minimum. So those are the kinds of things we're also looking for volunteers, but those are the kinds of things that our committee is doing. Great, fantastic, I appreciate that. Uh, and I'm sure, I just wanna remind folks as you hear the presentations, if you have any questions, put them in the chat. We're gonna capture those, we'll get those at the end. But now it's my pleasure to bring uh, to us, oh, where did I, oh, Shelley Broderick. Thank you so much, Denise. <clears throat> I just uh, am remembering so fondly uh, both of your parents who were true believers in our public law school. Uh, and I worked very closely with them um, because they didn't just cheer from the sidelines. They were all in. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to put my professor's hat on uh, for a minute. I teach state and local government. Um, and so we're going to just talk briefly about the two documents uh, that address control of DC's justice system. And the first is, as you're probably well aware, um, the Home Rule Charter. Uh, section, uh, uh, the Home Rule Charter was signed into law in 1973 on Christmas Eve by Richard Nixon, believe it or not. Um, and it gave DC some local control, uh, but Congress remained in, it with total plenary power. So they can change any law at any time uh, that they want. Uh, they're like the state legislature is to other, uh, in other jurisdictions. And, and they passed a whole section, 602, listing the limitations on the council, the things that the council can't do. And so section four, the council may not impose any act, resolution, or rule with respect to Title 11 of the DC Code regarding the organization and jurisdiction of the courts. The local legislature, DC Council, has no power over the courts. Who does have power over the courts? The President of the United States appoints our local judges. Um, and the US Congress uh, uh, you know, has to approve them uh, before they can take their seats. Right now we're down 14 judges. Why? Because either the president hasn't gotten around to nominating them, and that number was built up under Trump, um, or the Senate hasn't gotten around to confirming them. And what's going to happen if, if uh, you know, in any case. Uh, so that who is who has power of the courts. We've never had our own power, only jurisdiction in the country like that. Secondly, um, um, 
And, oh, so if and when we get local control of the courts, um, things will be different with statehood. Um, the uh, judges will be appointed by the governor, uh, currently the mayor, and approved by the legislature, which would, will be the DC, would, is now the DC Council, just like happens in other jurisdictions. Um, <clears throat> Casey, do you want to jump in and talk a little bit about clemency? Yeah, so this dovetails really nicely with what Shelley is saying about how DC does not have control over its courts. DC also does not have the power to grant clemency. So clemency is both commutations, which is where your sentence could be shortened, but you don't necessarily have your rights restored or your charges and conviction go away, and then pardons, where your sentence can also be shortened and you do have your rights restored. And it's almost as if it didn't really ever happen because you've been pardoned for it. So right now, DC does not have the power to grant clemency and all applications for clemency go to the president's desk. DC did pass the Clemency Board Establishment Act of 2018, and that let DC create its own Clemency Board, and it was very slow moving in progress, but they recently announced that they are ready to start accepting applications. But even then, those applications don't go to the mayor, they go to the president's desk, and it's still sort of in the hands of the president. And this is really problematic because out of the... At this point, it, it's, you know, 2,900 or so with the new clemency grants that um, President Biden did. Out of all of those clemency grants um, that were issued by five presidents since 1989, only one person with a DC conviction has been granted relief, only one person. And while this is certainly a statehood issue, right, because if, if, the governor of DC had control to make clemency decisions, certainly that number would be higher, but it's also a racial justice issue. 96% of the people serving cel uh, felony sentences for DC convictions are black. And so by and large, DC's black residents are being denied relief. And so with statehood, the governor instead of the president would be able to grant clemency and speaking to Keith's points earlier, you would have someone who, you know, prioritizes the people of the district and knows the community in that position of power to make those decisions, which right now the district does not have. Yeah, thank you, Casey. And, and, and again, someone who is accountable to the voters of the District of Columbia would have that power. All right, so getting back to the foundational documents um, that, that uh, about who has control of our justice system, um, another limitation on the DC Council in the Home Rule Charter is Section 8. Um, DC also may not impose any act, resolution, or rule relating to the duties or powers of the United States Attorney. So in DC, the Department of Justice, federal, a federal agency, um, handles all of the felonies of our local, uh, uh, you know, simple um, felonies, not big federal cases involving senators and national security. That's normally what's done by United States Attorney's Office and the Department of Justice in every other jurisdiction. But here they do our major basic, you know, drug possession, drug sale, you know, felonies. Um, and they also do almost all the misdemeanors. We do have an elected attorney general. Most of what our elected attorney general does is civil. Uh, they, they, they represent uh, the district in civil litigation. Um, and they do uh, some juvenile cases and they do some minor misdemeanors. Um, <clears throat> with statehood, that would change and the district would have some choices to make. And there were three options. They could um, open a new agency uh, that would do everything that the United States Attorney's Office now does um, on the local side, meaning not the national security federal cases, but the local criminal felonies and most of the misdemeanors. 
They could give all the duties uh, that the United States attorneys now have to the OAG, to the attorney general. But that's not their area of expertise at this time. Uh, so that would be taking on a huge new portfolio. Um, or uh, they could um, uh, uh, have, have a hybrid. And so the OAG would continue to do what it now does, which is some juvie um, and, and misdemeanors. But the new DA, district attorney, would uh, take on the criminal side. Uh, now, the second document that governs our justice system is the Revitalization Act, the National Capital Revitalization and Self-Government Improvement Act of 1997. So you will remember when we got home rule, we also got a huge unfunded uh, pension liability. All the teachers, all the firemen, the fire people, all the police officers, they all worked for the federal government. Suddenly they worked for the DC government and they had pensions that were due and owing, but there was no pension fund uh, saved up. Um, DC also under the Home Rule Charter it isn't allowed to tax income at the source where it's earned. Every other state, if you live in New Jersey, but work in New York, um, New York taxes you, taxes those earnings. We're not allowed to, that's called a commuter tax. It doesn't have anything to do with who's going over a bridge. That's taxing people where they work. Uh, we can't do that because of the Home Rule Charter. Um, uh, so, and we also can't tax 42% of the land in the District of Columbia because it's either uh, the mall, federal government buildings, um, um, hospitals, museums, the Smithsonian, we can't tax 42% of the land. So we, we had structural disastrous problems that almost made us go bankrupt. And so in 1997, we had, we, to avoid bankruptcy, uh, we did the Revitalization Act. And in that, we, get, we agreed to close Lorton Prison, which was our prison. And we gave all of our prisoners to the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Um, that, that means we, are, we have DC prisoners in 118 facilities in 34 states across the country. And you know what it means when you send um, our inmates away from their families, away from where they have ties to the community. It's a disaster. Uh, <clears throat> Professor, I, we we were um, kind of limited to five minutes, and I know that Casey took a little of that time. I'm not quite sure how you all are going to coordinate this, so I don't. I, with the information you're giving is, I, I hate to cut you off. I don't want to <laughs> do that, but if Casey still has to give a presentation, I uh, want you to kind of bring it to a close and get her in. Okay, um, let me just. I, you were about, I'm, I'm about two sentences away. So your timing is perfect. And I apologize for being a little long winded. I, I just trying to provide a little context to why we're where we are. Um, we the revitalization Act closed Lorton transferred our felons to the BOP transferred the parole authority to the US Parole Commission and established the federal uh, offender supervision and court services agency CSOSA. Um, so we had all of a sudden federalized all sorts of um, activities that I'll come back to after Casey tells us about parole. Yeah, it was we're that close. <laughs> Thank you, Shelley. No, I love the passion. <laughs> um, so the United States Parole Commission, as Shelley said, has authority, con um, authority over people convicted of DC code offenses due to the Revitalization Act. The United States Parole Commission, or USPC, has been trying to close its doors for years now to cease operations. And right now, the USPC is slated to cease operations on November 1st, 2022. So that is this fall. However, DC has no viable alternative to the United States Parole Commission. And so it's very likely that Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton is going to have to ask Congress for an extension. This extension comes after two years ago, she asked him for a two year extension because DC still did not have a viable alternative for local control of parole. 
And I think that this is really important to talk about today because it highlights that there are significant pieces and components of DC's criminal legal system that DC can take control over now. It doesn't have to wait until statehood. We can have local control of parole right now. And the upside of that is we, one, we reclaim a piece of our criminal legal system, but two, the district signals to Congress, to the president, to other D.C. leaders that D.C. is ready and primed for statehood, um, showing that we have the, the will and the initiative and the capabilities of taking back these very, very key functions. And I think the other piece to this conversation is that advocates have been pushing for local control of parole for years, um, and several organizations or coalitions have made specific recommendations on what that paroling authority should look like or what values it should have. But the really key piece here is there are, there are pieces of our system that we can take back that then signal to Congress that we're ready and we mean business about statehood. You're done? <laughs> yes, yeah, and then Shelly, you're yeah. muted. Wonderful, okay, that's fantastic. So I, I just wanna jump in really quick. I wanna go back um, to you, Keith, because uh, you know you, you were talking about voting and we're in the midst of a, new, uh, a primary election right now and then we're gonna go you know, into our general election in the fall. Every, everything that you've talked about, you know, is what exists now. What would be different uh, if DC had statehood for um, those who are incarcerated either locally or outside of the District of Columbia? What, what would statehood do that you all aren't already doing? Uh, well, <clears throat> several things actually. One, you, you might not have as many prisoners in the first place because of um, prosecutor, prosecutorial decisions that may be otherwise made different. <clears throat> Two, um, we would have control over the, our citizens, our, our residents um, directly and BOP when, when for whatever reason, were there in the federal system, um, because it's, unli it's unlikely that, you know, there's gonna be a jail or prison in the District of Columbia that would probably have to be worked out and Shelly probably could speak to more about that. But where our interactions with the Bureau of Prisons, you know, we're, we're acting as the volunteers calling the Bureau of Prisons and saying, hey, you know, we've got a new law, blah, blah, blah. But you'd have an agency, a governmental agency who would pick up the phone and say, you know, you're, you're not following procedures. We can make noise, but as, a, as we're just volunteers. Um, and they don't, there's no governmental person that they have to listen to or, or, or be accountable to, and that would change. So a lot of the decisions that are made about either going to prison, where are you going to prison, how long you're going to be, whether you even get uh, charged with anything, is going to be made by somebody accountable to the citizens of the District of Columbia. And that's probably the biggest thing, at least in my view. Shelly, did you want to add to that? I'm sorry, uh, I, I muted myself as per instructions and <laughs> forgot. Um, I don't, I think uh, Keith hit the nail on the head. I, I think he was just right. Um, I, I was char charged in our intros, Denise, just so you know, we started off with each having 10 minutes and we said, let's go down to five, but then Casey and I talked through, the, we can't possibly, cover the number of topics that we were given. So I've got a couple more if you can stand, and I promise not to filibuster. Please go right <laughs> ahead. Please go ahead. Uh, I, I, I'm supposed to talk about um, C. Sosa and, um, and also uh, the jails, uh, which I know a lot about. So the auxiliary agencies uh, that are federal because of the Revitalization Act include C. Sosa, CSOSA has its court supervision, I'm sorry, court services and offender supervision agency. It has a $248 million budget and a thousand employees. 15,000 of our neighbors are on pro, parole, probation or supervised release each year. Um, that's a huge agency. Within that agency is the Pretrial Services Administration. It used to be that all of these uh, or, or duties were performed by the superior court. 
uh, and, and by the Pretrial Services Agency of DC. And when it became federal, the good news is the go federal government took on the budget. Uh, the bad news is um, we lost the opportunity for our residents um, to perform these functions with our residents. Um, and that's a huge uh, issue. And, and we want to address that with statehood. It would come back under local control. Um, this, so we also have the Public Defender Service, which has a $42 million budget and 450 employees. That organization um, is run by an independent board. And we actually think that's a good model to continue. Um, it's not just a, a federally appointed, a presidentially appointed head, and it's, and, and it's run that way. Um, we also talk about facilities. So our, um, we have a uh, uh, CDF, which was built in 1976. It's 46 years old. Uh, the Correctional Treatment Facility, CTF, was built in 1992, it's 30 years old, same age as my daughter. Um, uh, Pre-pandemic, we had 5,800 people locked up. Uh, we had 4,000 people in the Bureau of Prisoners. We now have 2,600. Um, uh, <clears throat> in the DC's current capacity, we can house 3,624. Uh, 14 of 100 of whom can be in the CTF and 2,164 in CDF. Um, currently locked up, the Department of Corrections has 1,327. Uh, we saw a 31% reduction in those who were incarcerated when we had the confluence of the pandemic. Uh, and the racial reckoning. All of a sudden we came to understand that we didn't have to lock up every misdemeanant. We didn't have the police making traffic stops that so often result in the incarceration of black men. Um, we've, we, 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 we took a look at the racial disparities at long last. It kills me that it was only when white insurrectionists were locked up the, at the jail that we woke up, oh, the conditions at the jail are terrible. Wow, we have to do something. Uh, it just kills me because we've been screaming about it for decades, decades. I was a criminal defense lawyer on the front lines and it's been decades that we've known these conditions are horrible. Uh, so um, the racial disparities, DC is 47% African-American, 86% uh, of those arrested are African-American, 92% of those in the jail are African-American, 95% of those serving long sentences, you got it, African-American. It's just outrageous. So who's locked up in the jail? 20% of the people locked up in the jail are, are there for two to seven days. If they only have to be locked up for two to seven days, don't they, why don't we not lock them up? Um, people, when they get locked up, even for a short time, lose their jobs. They're not taking care of their kids or their or their seniors. Um, they are just not. Um, uh, it, it's just a disaster. They often lose housing. Sixty-two percent of those incarcerated have either uh, substance abuse issues or serious mental illness or both. Sixty-two percent. We spend $88,105 to lock up each person for a year in the DC jail, $88,000. How about if we not lock a whole bunch of those people up and put that money toward uh, behavioral health services and, uh, and uh, substance abuse uh, services uh, and, and stop in involving people in the criminal justice system at all? These are the kinds of things we can do with local control. Um, when we close the jail, which we wanna do, we wanna have both current jails gone within 10 years. Uh, by 2026, we wanna build an annex and stop using the CDF. Um, uh, it, by, within 10 years, we wanna um, have all of our prisoners moved back to the District of Columbia and be housed in a new, smaller, non-traditional facility 
where the people locked up are those only those who cannot safely be released into the community, where we stop locking people up for missing a parole, you know, missing a meeting or having a dirty urine or smoking marijuana, which by the way is legal, um, but we still lock people up for those things all the time. Shelly, could I add something? So I, I think Shelly is also speaking to, so she's talking about the, the condition issues in the Department of Corrections and DC has control over DOC, right? And this still happened. DC does not have control over those Federal Bureau of Prison facilities that our residents are sent to. So DC contracts with the Federal Bureau of Prisons and folks who are convicted of DC code offenses and sentenced to typically more than a year prison time are sent to a handful of Federal Bureau of Prison facilities across the country. And we only know what they tell us. So if there is a structural issue, if there is a COVID outbreak and people are getting sick, DC only knows what they'll share with us and what they'll tell us. We can't ensure that those people are getting, you know, adequate educational supports or opportunities, that they are having room for growth or, you know, sort of transformative experiences while incarcerated. We can't ensure that they're, be treating, they're being treated with the dignity that they deserve, right? Because they're in the BOP and DC does not have control. And so as Shelley was sort of alluding to, the District Task Force on Jails and Justice has this three-phase plan to build a new facility in the district, and that plan includes bringing people home from the BOP, the, uh, the Bureau of Prisons, and ending DC's contract with them. That way we would have direct control and oversight over those people, and those facilities would be directly accountable to the district and DC residents. And we can make sure folks are housed and treated with the dignity and respect that they deserve, while also hopefully housing them inside a facility that looks entirely different than what the DC jail looks like now. So Casey, um, you, you kind of went to where, I, where my question was gonna go and, and it's where you first started. Uh, and I hope I can remember what it was, but it's, uh, you, you were, well, first of all, for those that are, uh, those DC residents that are incarcerated in federal prisons across the country, you're not saying that, you know, there are services that are available to inmates from other places that are not accessible to district uh, inmates. That's not what you're saying, or is it? Or, I mean, and are you saying that if DC had the power or had its own um, institutions in that way, whatever they, the federal prisons aren't offering to them, we could do that if they were incarcerated within our own federal prison system. Is that what you're saying? Yes, yeah, so I think if I understand your question, the answer is yes, and Shelly and Keith can certainly butt in and, and add as well. But so basically right now, since folks convicted of DC code offenses are sort of sprawled across the country, we can't necessarily ensure consistency of services, quality of services, access to services, because every Bureau of Prisons facility in the country is just sort of like doing its own thing, right? They're sort of operating in their own silo. And so one person might be at a facility where they have access to programs that could help them earn good time credits. And another person might be somewhere where they're having a really tough time getting that. And that impacts those outcomes by bringing them home to the district and a facility that we have control over, we can ensure that sort of consistency, quality and accessibility of, um, of services. And I see Keith has unmuted himself. So I don't know if he wants to add something. And I was going to go to him next, actually, because I do want to ask Keith, but regardless of whatever my question is, I want you to don't forget your point. But, um, I, I, and this is no indictment on our, our residents who happen to be in federal facilities, but do, does that, this whole, is there any understanding of why, particularly if they're able to vote, Denise, you are freezing. So we got if they're able to vote and then you've frozen. So I don't know, Keith, in the meantime, if you want to say whatever you wanted to say. Well, I think I, I, I know where she was going. Um, 
the point is that in facilities, <clears throat> it really depends on where you are and who is in charge. Now, a lot of these facilities tend to be, shall we say, in rural areas where um, those who are, shall we say, um, more diversified in their outlook on life are not the ones manning these facilities. And so when you're going into these facilities, especially, you know, we just said 95% of DC residents are, are African-American who are in the prisons. Those in, 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 whether it's in Cumberland, Maryland, or Mississippi, or in Alabama, or somewhere, the people in charge just don't really care one whit about the District of Columbia for a whole host of reasons some of which are political, some of which are just who they are. Um, and so the actions that they take and the things that they do, you know, for example, they will, you know, right now today, last week we had, a, about a month ago, we had a problem where we were sending in uh, the ballot information um, and it was in color. There was some color was part of the print and they threw it out because it was printed in color. I mean, this is that kind of stupidity that we have going on. And it's just because they can't. Now, why they have the rule, and maybe, you know, maybe there's an important reason, but the point is that they are arbit making arbitrary decisions based on how they feel and not necessarily what the rules are. So you do get a disparity in the, 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 the quality of the, of, the, of the facility <clears throat> to some degree based on where you go. Um, and, you know, being there is not, you know, not the best thing in the world, especially for, you know, youth. I, I remember one youth who it struck me um, that he talked about, and I don't know what the, what his deal was, but he talked about he, he had gotten 18, he had accepted a, a plea for 18 years, and he's, I mean, sorry, 18 months it was 18 months, 18 months. And that was just okay. He thought he thought it was, I think it was a marijuana charge. So, you know, already you we're going to jail for marijuana. And he thought, well, 18 months, that's great. Well, 18 months is two years of some of, of a kid's life. That is, that is a huge chunk of developmental time that they have lost. And in some facilities, you, you're going to get nothing. Uh, it, the, the stuff that they have is, you know, fundamentally useless for anybody trying to further themselves as a as a productive citizen of these United States. So yes, I, I would agree where you go is, is as random as random can be and, and as likely as not, you're gonna run into a hostile environment, especially as an African-American by way of the people who are running the facility. Well, I, I appreciate just... that, you know, uh, the internet doesn't stop a show and you all kept rolling right along while I'm trying to leap the net. So I appreciate that. But, I, but part of my question too, Keith, and, and I wanna talk about juvenile offenders as well, but is there any, um, as I'm saying, there's no indictment on the, um, those who are incarcerated wherever they are, but is there any understanding of what statehood would mean for, for those? Um, you know, that because we are what we are, they end up being where they are with no... Um... I mean, it, frankly, I would say no. Okay, uh, all right, they, they, they view the system as the system as a, a global thing. Yes. And because it, 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 they're, 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 you know, they're being treated by the system that is really external to the District of Columbia and, and accountability to the citizens of the District of Columbia. So they just see it as one thing. And all they see is us or and the young people, and especially young people, you know, the, the big thing, you got a lot of, the, you know, a lot of people, there are a number of people there for drug offenses, you know, distributing marijuana, et cetera, where there's a whole industry out here of, we know who's making the money selling marijuana, and we know who's going to jail for selling marijuana. <clears throat> that's a commonly understood thing. Again, that's a system problem. So not, not, and I don't think they equate, you know, it would be any different for them. Um, we would have to show them by way of the actions that we take and the decisions that are made that 
being a, a statehood would make a difference. But okay. just because they don't understand it, that don't mean that's not what we shouldn't be doing. I agree. I agree. That I just I was just curious if, if that conversation had even gotten to that level, especially based upon what you talked about with this, you know, Baltimore and and the um, Marilyn Mosley there. But um, Shelly, as it relates to um, juvenile offenders, uh, and Anne posed this question. Um, you know, what happens with them? What, what, and what would be different if the district had statehood? Actually, I don't think much. Okay. Uh, we, we, we think heavens, uh, some years back, closed Oak Hill um, underwent a terrific process of thinking through what kids need to be in a secure facility, detention facility, and what else we should be doing with kids. So we, when we built a new facility, it was much, much smaller and meant to house a small group of people and provide uh, excellent services with the notion of helping them to be ready to come back successfully uh, into the society. And so we've got that already. We, we are, oh, our, uh, the Office of the Attorney General uh, handles the uh, juvenile matters. And so that wouldn't change. Uh, Reverend Wendy Hamilton asked, what steps need to be taken to return parole authority to DC before the November deadline? Well, I think that's a, a really good question. And I think, unfortunately, I don't know if there is much that can be done. So the District Task Force on Jails and Justice in their phase two report put out a list of qualities that they wanted to see in a new paroling authority and other organizations had put out similar reports as well. And DC advocates made it really clear that restoring local control of parole was a priority. Um, and the deputy mayor for public safety and justice has sort of been tasked with navigating that for the district. And right now there is no publicly available viable solution to local control of parole. And so I think we're folks on this chat or on this um, webinar to want to try to push this forward. I do think that that contacting the deputy mayor for public safety and justice, Chris Geldar, and saying this is important to us, this is a priority, this is a statehood issue. Um, and as both Shelley and Keith have mentioned about the racial disparities in DC's criminal legal system, this is a racial justice issue as well. It's about bringing DC's black residents home. Um, I think reaching out to the deputy mayor's office and advocating for that is one of the biggest things we can do to try to get this as a priority. But right now, I think, unfortunately, the district has sort of continued to put off coming up with a concrete plan for local control of parole and the likelihood that between now and May 2022, we're able to have that viable plan in place, change the, uh, the, the legislation and statutes necessary to establish local control of parole. I think is a really big long shot, but making your voice heard to the deputy mayor is certainly one way to say like, we prioritize this and we are watching and you are accountable to us. I, I, and I will just add, you know, there are a couple of ways to go. You can um, create a new independent DC paroling authority. Um, and that would be uh, people who would be appointed by the mayor and, and, and he or she whoever it's going to be, um, could uh, appoint uh, former inmates, could appoint defense attorneys, could appoint prosecutors, you know, could, could make the choices that reflect DC values and who would be on that paroling authority, what the training would be, and so forth. It's all eminently doable. There are paroling authority models all over the place. Um, and it costs about $13 million. So, you know, what we're doing now, so it'd be, we could do it much more cheaply to have our own paroling authority. We also could have a hybrid and have the courts um, continue to do second chance and compassionate release uh, sentencing, which they have great expertise in and do a terrific job, and then have our paroling authority to do the rest. 
uh, or we could have the courts do it. The only problem with uh, the biggest problem with having the courts um, do it, there are two. One is they're down 14 judges and they simply, they don't want it. They don't, they can't possibly take on um, that huge new responsibility as understaffed as they are. And as long as we don't have control over when they get appointed and how they get appointed, um, that can continue for decades. Uh, so they, we, they can't do it as a, as a, as a practical matter. Um, and secondly, the court, the, the judges, as good as our bench is, they're appointed by the president of the United States. Um, they, 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 they are confirmed by the United States Senate. They are not DC people necessarily. Um, and that's a problem, you know, it just is. That was actually my next question too about the judges. Uh, the uh, Congresswoman Norton plays a role in that process, right? No, so so you, that's a common misconception. Um, the Congresswoman Norton ha, um, it has a commission where she's allowed to weigh in on the federal judges. Um, so I'm on that commission, and for example, take great pride in having been a part of the recommendation of Katanji Brown Jackson. Uh, Eleanor Holmes Norton nominated Katanji as a federal judge. Um, in DC and many other fantastic people. This, this commission working with the Congresswoman has changed the complexion of the federal district court in DC. For our local court, um, <clears throat> there is a, there's a judicial, ju judicial nominations committee. Um, it's chaired by Emmett Sullivan, who's a federal judge. Um, and on it are members who are not, uh, th th it's not, it, it, Th that commission has to send people to who nom three nominations to whoever is the president. So, for example, when it's President Trump, you have to send candidates that President Trump will nom be, be willing to nominate. Um, when another president, you have to send candidates that the uh, that president would be willing to nominate to the court. You know, um, so they are federally appointed. It's just not DC values. And there's no residence requirement or anything for judges. So they could come from any place. Any And, and what would change if we had statehood? So the governor um, would appoint the judges. And the and that would be what, what is now the mayor would become the governor. And he or she would appoint the judges. They would be confirmed by what is now the DC Council, but would be the state of Washington Douglas Commonwealth um, legislature. Okay. That would I, be a huge uh, difference. Oh yes, uh, definitely. I, I wanna encourage those of you out there, if you have any questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat. Uh, we're having a great dialogue here and I like, I like um, the, the communications we're having, but I wanna make sure I get your questions in. And I know that I have uh, actually David Schwartzman, uh, who really wrote a lot here, but I did see a question mark. So I went to where that question mark started. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, his question is, um, given the large racial and economic disparities in DC, how should the statehood movement prepare for creating a truly visionary constitution once statehood is achieved, that could be a basis for eliminating these disparities. Anybody want to take that? Well, I'd be happy to start with it. Um, and I think in part of what David alludes to is in 2016, uh, the mayor had a committee uh, on which I served draft a constitution. Um, and, this uh, and this constitution was because the mayor wanted to pursue the Tennessee plan with the hope that Hillary Clinton, who supported statehood for the district, would become the president. Uh, mayor Bowser wanted to be ready. And so she put a team together to write a constitution. Um, we wrote a constitution that did not make massive changes in everything. Um, we wanted one that would be approved um, and, and the most important factor would be that it would be a constitutional convention within two years so that all the visionary changes we all want to really spend time on could, could come into being. 
But in any case, that constitution was passed by the citizens of the District of Columbia by 86% of the vote. Um, more voted for the uh, Statehood Admission Act for DC than voted for uh, marijuana to be legalized in, in DC. Um, in any case, we urged the mayor to ask every agency head at that time to develop a plan for statehood. What would, what would your agency need um, if you were going to, if we, we were going to be operating under statehood? That hasn't happened. That's something that should happen. We should start looking at what the needs are. Right now, um, DC Appleseed is working on a blueprint for what the changes would need to be in the criminal justice system under statehood uh, with regard to the jails, with regard to the courts, with regard to the prosecution function, with regard to the auxiliary agencies, clemency and, and parole. So um, there is work going on about what has to take place, I'm happy to say, um, but there's a lot more work to be done, particularly across the agencies. You mentioned earlier, um, Shelley, a little bit about, you know, what CISOSA uh, the, and, a, and a couple of agencies, how much the budget is, how many people are working in these agencies. Um, if uh, the district acquired statehood, what would that mean? And I know there's going to be a conversation about this later on in this series, but what does that look like if anybody wants to talk about that? Uh, you know, what will it cost the district? Uh, will it be an increase in cost or a reduction in cost? And, and um, I want um, Keith also to talk about what would be key things that need to go into uh, what we would want to see uh, in our um, uh, system if the district took it over, if, if we had statehood and we were in control of that. Let me hit the cost and okay. then Keith. You take the substance. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it would, of course, um, be uh, a, a lot of uh, money because the district would be responsible for the things we gave up um, under the Revitalization Act. So jails, um, uh, CSOSA, public defender, um, uh, pretrial services, you know, we, we would have those costs for the prosecution function now borne by the United States government. Uh, we would have to take those costs up, but we would no longer be prohibited from taxing revenue at its source. Uh, so the vast majority of the federal government workforce lives in Maryland and Virginia, and they don't pay any taxes to, to us. Um, and yet we have to provide fire and sewer and, you know, all the services to, to, to them. Um, and so that it's, you know, that's, we, that would change. That's one huge change. Uh, and would, that would and on that note, would we, with statehood, would we have to get congressional approval in order to do that tax? Okay, so that's- I'm No, sure. I mean, that's the whole thing. We, we yeah. are, we would be a state. Right. And like every other state, we would have our own constitution and that constitution would permit us to tax as other states tax. Uh, that constitution would permit us to the process for which we identify and appoint judges. That constitution would allow us to uh, uh, decide how we wanted to do the prosecution function. Do we want a DA, an elected DA? Do we want to appoint the attorney general who does the civil stuff as happens in most states, but have the DA who does the criminal stuff be elected? You know, how do we want to do it? That would be up to DC to decide. And these are the questions that we should be grappling with now so that we're ready when the time comes. And, and Keith, what, what would be different? What, what do you think that the district would be able to offer uh, to our, our inmates if we were in control? And so I, I think one of the things that, that Shelly talked about <clears throat> is the number of employees that are in CSOSA. Um, I, I don't have any facts, maybe they do, but my guess is the vast majority of them don't live in the District of Columbia, uh, have no relationship with the District of Columbia, and don't, you know, they may have a few friends, but not, not many because they operate other places. And so they're not 
really caring, depending on who they are as a person, uh, about the, the, the folks within the District of Columbia. So by having uh, residents of the District of Columbia uh, work these jobs, you, you, you get a couple of different things. One, that's revenue, uh, that, that DC residents are earning money here. Those are good paying jobs. And then those dollars are, are being recirculated back within the District of Columbia. That's, that's a, a huge pot of money. Two, you, you have people, you know, we talked about, um, you know, somebody sending somebody to D.C. jail because they missed an appointment. It, you know, if you are a D.C. resident and you live down the street from the, the mother of the person who you were about to send to jail, it's a different dynamic in your thinking. So by infusing that agency with people vested in the District of Columbia, regardless of, of, of their race, um, they are a District of Columbia residents, you, you get financial benefits, you get community benefits, and you get decision making, again, based on, you know, people living down the street, as opposed to somebody they never saw before, never will see again, and frankly, don't care what happens to them. And, and Casey, I don't know whether you jump in here or not, but, um, uh, you know, we talked about the conditions, uh, now that we've had this uh, these folks, these insurrectionists who said the conditions at DC jail were so horrible. And uh, something uh, um, that uh, Shelly said, we've been complaining about, the district residents have been, been complaining about for eons. Uh, but uh, I, don't, what, I don't know what the temperament is for folks who, one, may want a new prison, where they want the prison. Uh, we went down that road a few years ago and, 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 and it didn't end up anywhere. Um, one, you know, what are your thoughts about that? And two, what difference would statehood make? Yeah, so I think that, so right now the district in the proposed FY23 budget does have funding allocated for the sort of like thought process around and construction of an annex to the central treatment facility, which is like the slightly less old, slightly better facility of the two of them. Um, and the thought process is that the central detention facility or the DC jail would be demolished um, while this annex is being built. And then everyone who is currently housed at the central detention facility and the CTF, the central treatment facility, they'd all be housed in the central treatment facility in this new annex. Um, that is just one part of the district task force on jails and justices, three part plan. And that three part plan does include a wholesale new facility that is culturally, environmentally, architecturally different than the current facilities we have now. And this plan does account for bringing people home. And so the way that statehood sort of interacts with this right is theoretically, if, if the district got statehood, ideally, we want to end our contract with the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Um, and that's something that if the district moves and acts on the task force's three-phase plan, we could end that contract before statehood, or even better, they coincide at the same time. Or we get statehood, and then that forces us to act to bring people home. Um, I think, too, so with the current conditions at the D.C. jail, the U.S. Marshal Service um, a federal uh, agency has come in to provide, um, I suppose, technical assistance through corrective action plans um, in a memorandum of understanding or MOU with the Department of Corrections to fix all of the issues that it found during its inspection. And while certainly there is, you know, it's, it's hard getting information out of even DC agencies, these corrective action plans have not been made publicly available. There are no publicly available metrics um, that show sort of how they've been completed and, and how we're going to sort of judge if they've been successful and improve the conditions. And certainly we might have had a hard time getting that right if it was just the DOC, but you bring in a federal agency and it sort of shrouds it in this lack of transparency and lack of accountability because the US Marshal Service is not accountable to the district. But with statehood and with our own facility, um, a facility that the task force plans to have built where the current facility is, so that sort of answers the, the land question, but building it on reservation 13, um, 
with statehood, we would have control and accountability and God forbid something similar happen, we would be able to go in and ask the questions and get the answers. And, you know, when you call our DC council members and say, hey, this is a problem, you need to figure out what's going on, they would have the power and authority to do that. And right now we are at the mercy of what a federal agency decides to tell us. So speaking of power and authority, I mean, right now, who, if we, you know, assuming we, we get statehood, who would have that power authority? Who would be responsible for uh, this transition from, you know, a federal to a local uh, control of our, of our prisons? Would it be the mayor, the council? How, how would that work? It would be the governor. You said that before, yes. And the legislature, and the legislature um, which would be, you know, we, I'm so embarrassed, I'm, I apologize. <laughs> we, we would decide what the structure of our legislature, legislature would be. So I'm guessing it would be significantly bigger. Our DC council members represent a huge number of people. Um, states have far more representatives uh, to represent their people. Uh, you know, we have 700,000 people, we, we need some more representation. So anyway, but our legislature and our governor uh, would have those powers. And um, Keith, what role would, you know, the, let's say the returning citizen population, what, what would you want to see uh, their role to be in this process? So, you know, being on committees um, like the parole committee, um, um, where they have some impact, I mean, it's obviously going to be based on the, the individuals themselves, but um, they are some very smart folks who are, happen to be incarcerated and they have talent. Um, so we would utilize their talent as we would utilize the talent of, of any citizenry within the District of Columbia. I mean, it does not, you know, there's nothing magic about, because they are, you know, incarcerated, do they, they, they yes, they have some perspective, but um, they would be, a, continue to be an asset, like all other residents are an asset to the things that the government is trying to do. And they will plug and play where it made sense. It sounds- so There's no good answer to that, but it's not, a, you know. Yeah, I, I just, you know, I, I think it's just saying that there's a, a need absolutely to make sure that, you know, as we set up these structures, that all voices are heard. And I didn't know if there would be some kind of advocacy to make sure that um, everybody's at the table as we make, because there are a lot of decisions that have to be made and yeah, how we can make them. I'm pretty sure there'll be a natural flow of that kind of uh, where they would be best fit in in terms of where they could be of most assistance. Um, it, as you said, the agencies and they set up the process and procedures, uh, it would kind of make it sense on its own. For now, <laughs> Shelly would probably could tell you better than I. So, so I, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, we, I mean, we're, we're getting close to the end, but I, I just want to make sure that um, there isn't something that we could have or should have had uh, during our conversation that has not come up uh, that's burning on uh, the minds of uh, uh, the three of you that you think we need to add to this conversation before we bring it to a close. And, and um, Shelly, anything that you're, I know you had a list and I didn't want to uh, you know, cut that off, but is there something else that you think that's really, that people need to know that we haven't touched on? Uh, well, I apologize for talking on and on and on so much. Um, I, I, I think I got through my list and I appreciate your forbearance about that. Um, so Casey and Keith, let me defer to you guys. Casey, you go first. Ladies um, first, hers first. Thank you. Uh, no, I really do. I, I feel like we covered a lot of it. I think if I had one takeaway that I want people to walk away with. Um, of course, statehood is 
incredibly important, but I also want to emphasize that there are things that we can do now to regain local control of our criminal legal system to, you know, better, you know, positively impact the lives of DC's justice involved residents and to signal to Congress and the president that the district is ready for statehood. Um, you know, local control of parole is just one of those things, um, but it's something that you know, has the ability to make a big impact on the lives of people convicted of DC code offenses who are seeking relief. And so I think that that's really just sort of my parting thought is there are things that we can and should be doing and pushing for and advocating now that while statehood may be the ultimate goal, those are things that we don't have to wait for um, and are things that would be tremendously helpful and important and transformative to DC's criminal legal system. And with that, Keith, I am happy to turn it to you. Well, Best for last. You do, before you do, Casey, I do mm -hmm. want to ask, is there any example of something that you could point to that, you know, really sort of fits in that category that we did absolutely do? Um, um, or, or are you saying we haven't done anything and we need to do more? You know, is, is there something you can point to that we've done over the you know, let's say over the past 10 years uh, that shows that um, we really want to be in control of this process. Does anybody? It looks like Shelly's got an answer. And I'm happy to give it to her, but it looks like she's yeah. got one. Well, um, yes, we have clawed back some local control. Uh, and the first thing was we have an elected attorney general. That was huge. You know, we, we, DC Appleseed all hail, um, came up with a referendum. The citizenry voted wildly in favor of having an elected attorney general. Uh, the council disagreed. We went back and forth, but we made that happen. And we've now had two terms um, of uh, an elected attorney general. And we're about to have a new, a new elected attorney general. That was huge. Secondly, budget autonomy. Same thing, actually Appleseed, uh, again, brought forward the whole idea of budget autonomy that's been approved by the citizenry um, and, and we have that now. We're about to do a third uh, bite at the apple um, and, and that is um, Mary Che and Phil Mendelson are gonna introduce a bill um, that will amend the Delegate Act. We currently have a, the delegate has a non, we have a non-voting delegate. What we want to have is a delegate who can vote in Congress on matters exclusively related to the district. Um, and so that is a, going to be introduced in the council. Um, and we believe that can happen. We want, we're urging the members to fast track it so that we can make that happen before the midterm elections, so that it's in place. Uh, the Congress could, if both houses of, of the Congress decided against that and approved a, a act of, uh, opposing it, uh, they could defeat it. But that is really hard to do. They only have 30 days to do it. And they would have to be deeply organized and, and to make that happen. And they haven't as yet taken those measures. Um, and so that would be the third bite at the apple to try to get more local control. I thank you for sharing that because I think we need to celebrate our victories even if it's only three, <laughs> but I'm sure after the shows, this program's over, you'll think, well, I should have mentioned the. <laughs> Uh, uh, Keith, did you come up with something that you, you know, was burning that you don't want to leave uh, us this yeah, evening? I mean, there, there is a, there is a, I do have a couple of thoughts. I think, you know, the criminal justice system in this discussion is, 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 is a three-part series. Um, I think we can all universally agree that um, the way we would run our households, if we had somebody else coming to tell us um, how to spend our money, how to run our households, what the rules are going to be within our respective households, we would be furious. So not having statehood should be, we should be equally furious. And I think we have to do two things. One, a lot of the things that Casey says, we, we need to hold our elected officials accountable and start getting them, pushing them to have us start to look like a state, act like a state, 
and have things in place that so that way when it's time, we are not starting, we are finished, we are ready to go. So I think that's one thing. Last summer, I mean last summer, last the last election cycle, I spent a lot of time on the phone volunteering, calling for, you know, in different states, um, trying to elect this Democratic senator or that Democratic person, whatever, whatever. If we want to be a state, I mean, the, the bottom line is we're going to have to change this count. The 50 has got to get to 52. I mean, and then we got to keep the house. So, yes, we got to do all this other stuff. But then now we need to start helping ourselves take control by pushing other folks to, to go out and vote for the people we need to get what we need. We can't sit back and wait and hope that we get 52 senators and, and, and so many Democrats in, in the House. We got to go help make it happen, because if we're not willing to engage in that process and make it happen, then why should anybody else? So that would be my parting shot. Great. Right. Fantastic. Shelly, I don't know. I know you, you have had a lot to say, but is there anything else that you wanted to add? They said it couldn't be done. No. <laughs> I, 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 I want to give Ann a chance to take us home. Yeah, that well, she's got it. She's, we are right at 825. We said we would turn it back over to her then. I just want to say I thank you all for a great conversation. I learned a lot this evening. And uh, I'm glad for those people who uh, were in the chat, said a few things, Reverend Wendy Hamilton and, and Andrew Phelps and a couple of others who uh, from all over the city, Eleanor Hart and some others who represent most of the wards in the city and, um, uh, and take it over and, and tell us what's gonna come up next. But it's been a pleasure to serve you. It would help to unmute myself. <laughs> Well, I am so delighted with this very substantive and very, I learned so much. I am not a lawyer. I am a social worker. And I, I like, wow. So I'm, I'm going to be really cogitating on all of this. And so I'm totally delighted. And just to be clear, we've recorded this session and we will get it posted to our YouTube channel. It'll be a few days before we get that done. But once we do, we will make sure that you all have the links to that, um, that post so that you can send it to other people and, and put it out there. Um, the, we have two more. This is, the th this is the first one. We have two more. Um, that will be coming up. Um, and now am I going to remember the dates? Not right this instant. <laughs> but the next one is going to be on governance. You know, it's like, well, how does this constitution work? And what's going to happen? And who's, how are things going to change? And then the third one is called What's It Worth? Which is going to really, really be talking about um, what are the categories of, then we've touched a little bit on it tonight, but what are the categories of change that will be changing in terms of what we actually are responsible for uh, to pay for and how are we gonna do that? Then we have a, um, a one day conference that we're planning in the fall. I do remember that one, that's September 17th. Um, and um, that one day conference, I think is probably gonna be hybrid because we still don't know about pandemic, um, but we're hoping to have at least some in person. And that will mean that we will bring all of these things together and uh, sort of have a state of DC statehood, where do we go from here kind of discussion. So let me just finish by thanking people. Thank you. To, to this amazing uh, panel. And thank you, Denise, for your excellent moderating and uh, making sure that the questions were done. Um, and uh, thanks to the members of the planning committee uh, that made this happen. That's Sharon Anderson. Thanks, Sharon, for doing the chat. Eleanor Hart, uh, Ann Stauffer, and Yilin Zhang. These are all people who will be continuing to do the planning. Um, we've got uh, Christian Janest that helped us get all these pieces in place. 
And of course, Lee Palmer has been our Zoom tech, so thank goodness. So this has really been a team effort. And um, so, you know, for the team, I'm wishing you all a good and peaceful night and hopefully see you next time. Good night. Good night. Thanks all.